Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grayson, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome everybody tonight uh, to our forum. We've got a nice crowd. We apologize for making you wait. It'll make, we'll make it worth your while. Don't worry. This is going to be a great discussion. Um, before we begin, I want to recognize uh, Ms. Teresa Hines, who's here in the front row. Uh, we may have something planned later in the evening for her, so we appreciate having you here. Yeah, it's okay to clap. <laughs> <laughs> We have three great co-sponsors for tonight's forum, and we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, first, the Harvard Kennedy School of Women in Public Policy Program, which does great work. We're excited to work with them on this, uh, this particular project. The Massachusetts Breast uh, Cancer Coalition, uh, which was started in 1991 here in the state, uh, has uh, done a lot of great work. Uh, and one of the best things they did is they helped to establish the Silent Spring Institute to, uh, to actually have their own little laboratory to do research on breast cancer research. Uh, especially down in, starting in the, in the Cape Cod area, uh, but really spreading, spreading statewide. So we're really, it's great to work with the three of them. And we have three incredible panelists tonight. I'm going to briefly introduce each of them. Uh, Dr. Julia Brody is the executive director of the Silent Spring Institute. To her left uh, is Sheila Jasanoff, who's a professor here at the Kennedy School, the Forsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies uh, at the Kennedy School. And Florence Williams, who's an author of a new book that just received a really favorable review Sunday in the New York Times book review entitled Breasts, which is right here. You can buy it at the Harvard Bookstore, The Coop, Amazon.com, anywhere else where good books are found, correct? <laughs> right. So let's, let's dive in. Um, 50, September 27th, so not quite the anniversary of today, uh, but on September 27th, 1962, so 50 years ago today, uh, to, almost to the week, Rachel Carson published the book Silent Spring. Now, she was a well-known author at the time, but wasn't really known as a social critic. And this book heralded the environmental movement. And if you look at the list of the most important books of the 20th century, this is one of the books that's always at and around the top, uh, top books in, um, of the last century and had an incredible impact. So much so that we're 50 years later, we're going to still talk about the impact. Uh, so we thought we'd begin tonight with talk about Rachel Carson, talk about the, the book and what it's meaning, and, and also some of the work that, uh, that you guys are doing. Okay. Uh, so Rachel Carson, there's so many different strands to her inspiration and her legacy. It's a real joy to be able to talk about her at this 50th anniversary, and also to celebrate the many women and men who came after, including Mrs. Heinz, who, who pursued her vision. Uh, she was really the first to carefully observe the effects of the new synthetic chemicals. They were new at the time, right after World War II. And she was the first really to observe the effects of synthetic chemicals on birds and fish and frogs. And um, that really kicked off the modern environmental movement and became the first warning that these chemicals that we were putting into the environment might affect human health as well. And st starting out with the huge successes of the early environmental movement, um, DDT was banned and some of the other organic chlorine pesticides that she wrote about. And we got the Clean Air Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Environmental Protection Agency. And although we may be kind of focused on their limitations now, we did get cleaner air and water um, thanks to Rachel Carson. Um, and then, in the 1990s, a new grassroots environmental movement came up that was focused on human health. Mass Breast Cancer Coalition was founded at that time when women were just discovering the breast cancer epidemic and seeing that breast cancer incidence was rising and no one was really paying attention to why incidence was rising and whether there were factors in the environment that we could discover to make, make it go back down. Um, and Mass Breast Cancer Coalition then founded Silent Spring Institute, as you said, to be a lab of our own for women's health. And actually, the science that Rachel Carson did, where she observed that birds exposed to DDT couldn't reproduce because their eggs were failing, their eggs were falling apart, that actually turned out to be relevant to breast cancer. But it was the, kind of the beginning of, of uh, a new science that looked at the effects of, of chemicals that might mimic or block hormones. And so now I think in the breast cancer and environment science, we have kind of three 
key pieces of science that originated then that are kind of coming together now. First, the basic biology. We found uh, several classes of chemicals that are plausibly linked to breast cancer because they cause breast cancers in animals, because they mimic uh, or block hormones like estrogen, which we know is a breast cancer risk factor, or because they affect the development of the breast in ways that increase susceptibility later on. So, and these chemicals uh, are in very common products. They're in um, our couches and our cook pans and raincoats and plastics and food packaging. So the second big strand of science in an area where Silent Spring Institute is really focused is on understanding exposure. We began to measure them in household air and dust and in Centers for Disease Control began measuring them in human blood and urine samples. So uh, we know that they don't actually stay in the products the way the manufacturers originally thought. They end up in our houses and in our bodies. And um, then this a third strand of the science uh, is about the effects over the life course. So we know that breast cancer risks can occur early in life, even before birth, as Rachel Carson saw with the effects on birds. And they can occur at other points in the life cycle, all the way up until the time of diagnosis. And that, putting these three strands together has become a key to our approach to um, breast cancer prevention because it means, for one thing, that human epidemiology isn't going to be the answer. We can't wait for that uh, because we have this 60-year time period of exposures to these ubiquitous chemicals to worry about. And uh, the, the Institute of Medicine last December came out with a report that very nicely uh, summarized this and created a real milestone the first time the medical community has uh, approached this issue and said, based on what we know now, it's time to begin reducing exposures to these chemicals that are plausibly linked to breast cancer because of their biology. Okay, thanks, Julie. Lawrence, tell us about your book and why you wrote it, wrote it what motivated you, and, and you know, make a pitch so they'll all go buy it when we're, when we're finished here, if they haven't already. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I really came at this topic from two angles. Uh, the first was as a science journalist, and the second was as a new mother. Uh, and, and what really started it was that I saw some research uh, that toxic chemicals were showing up in breast milk. And at the time, I was breastfeeding my daughter. Uh, so I, I was very uh, interested in this topic. I was concerned about it. And I, I was also you know, just personally curious about what was in my own breast milk. I find that people tend to be divided into two groups. There are people who really want to know what their DNA says and what's in their bodies. And there are people who, who don't want that information. But I've always been of the sort of wanting to know. Um, so I got an assignment from the New York Times Magazine. And I sent a vial of my breast milk um, overnight <laughs> to a lab in Germany. Uh, which at the time was really one of the only places in the world that was able to use very sensitive um, detection equipment. And my breast milk, we only looked for a few substances, but, but it, it came back um, with quite high levels, above average levels of brominated flame retardants, um, which are found, uh, as I learned, in many, many areas and places in our homes and in our food and in our water and in our soil. Uh, and it turns out that American women have levels that are 10 to 100 times higher than women anywhere else in the world. So that really launched me down this path. Um, it, it opened up a new uh, understanding for me of how our bodies are really sort of permeable to our environment. And, and this is something that Rachel Carson really first sort of brought up in Silent Spring because she talked about how what happens to the land and water and soil um, affects animal life. And, and she actually hinted that there could also be human effects. She described crop dusters, the pilots of these planes that spray DDT, as having lower sperm counts, for example. Um, she, she had never heard of the term endocrine disruptor. Uh, that came later. But she really um, you know, was prescient in sort of uh, viewing this. And um, so then I, I learned more about how the breast works. Uh, it's really an amazing organ. It's incredibly sensitive to the environment. Uh, and uh, it turns out that in many stages of development through its life cycle, through our life cycles, uh, the environment acts upon the breast, um, often in ways in modern times 
uh, that predispose it to breast cancer. Because when you're talking about the development of the breast, I find all roads sort of lead to breast cancer, unfortunately, um, when we're looking at modern life. And so I wanted to tell the story of the other life stages of the breast, not just the lactation stage, but also um, how it develops and what happens um, through puberty, uh, which is uh, very important to breast cancer risk, and then what happens um, all the way through menopause. So that's how the book started and, and how it finished. <laughs> Thanks. Professor Jezinoff, you, we've, had, we've heard from the two of them um, about their, their, their work in this area. Um, in the last 50 years, we've seen a lot of progress. We've seen a lot of different research and a lot of studies. And she told me not to ask her about her research or we would be here for a long time. So I'm not going to ask you that. But let me ask you, what's your take on, on Rachel Carson, her legacy, and some of the things that are going on now and what you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Trey. Um, I wish I could tell as happy a story in some ways as my two very accomplished um, co-panelists. Um, but my focus has been on law and public policy. And there, the story is one of decreasing engagement in some ways. I graduated from law school down the street in 1976, and uh, my first practice was in environmental law. Um, so I went right away into, and 76 was the year the Toxic Substances Control Act got enacted, which was supposed to bring the regulation of chemicals under a single roof. And when I started doing research, it's also roughly 15 years after the book, Rachel Carson's book. So I'm going to tell you three 15-year chunks. At the time that I got into looking at regulation, all of the federal agencies were actually focused on regulating carcinogens. The focus of attention between 1976 and 1980 in the US was on getting all the federal regulatory agencies on the same page around a single set of policies for regulating cancer-causing chemicals. And it was actually the topic of my very first book. But between 1980 and 1992, so fast forward another 15 years, we had something called deregulation. And that political will that was present in the late 1970s gradually had worn away. And we entered a period of scientific gridlock with people fighting on various sides. So even very well-known carcinogens like benzene and vinyl chloride became the subject of endless disputes and endless litigation in the federal government. And then you fast forward now to, you know, let's take 2007 as another 15-year chunk and you get into the beginnings of a transatlantic standoff. And I was really struck, Florence, at your saying that you had to send your sample away to Germany for the most sophisticated tests. But that's emblematic of the fact, in a way, that over this 50-year period, somehow even aspects of the scientific advantage have shifted away from this country, which is where the environmental movement was born, 1969, nobody else had a National Environmental Policy Act. So, you know, I think that um, in a way I'm extremely thankful to be sitting between Julia and Florence because I think that what we need is a re-energizing of the public to create a new politics of the environment. Um, but um, if we're looking for hope to Washington and the laws and the agencies, that is uh, not the place where I see the sparks of energy rising. Well, why don't we follow up with, with that about what would it take to re-energize, to have the next 50 years be better than the first 50 years, to, to put America back in the, maybe a leadership position as it was early on? And I think all of you can chime in on this one if you wish, all or any. I wish I knew the answer to that question, but I will say that I think um, the new science that is, and uh, work like Florence's book that is uh, revealing to people that the uh, products on the shelf haven't been safety tested, that's something that people that might motivate maybe people. don't yeah. know. Yeah. And, and as I was thinking about Rachel Carson's legacy, I was thinking in my darker moments that we are, in a sense, back where she started in the sense that we're putting chemicals into use before we test them and then trying to catch up as we figure out what they're doing. Uh, but, but I do think that there's a sense now of at least some people and moms being in the lead maybe saying 
wait a minute, I, I just woke up this morning to this new science story that the chemicals in my couch are breast carcinogens. Who, who decided that? Who said that was okay? And um, then they can, and they have begun to speak out in a different way. I agree. Uh, you know, Rachel Carson focused really a lot on DDT and other organochlorine pesticides. And it was only after DDT was found in breast milk that there was really a political movement sort of to, to ban it. And so I think when mothers get involved, uh, you know, in some ways I think breasts speak very loudly, you know, in more ways than <laughs> one. And uh, it, it can be a politicizing force. Well, um, Professor Janazov, you talked about, um, you said you're, you're, you're analysis worldwide, you've seen other countries. Germany was one that Florence mentioned. Are there other countries that are doing this better? And if so, why? Uh, and what are, why are they maybe being more successful in, in uh, addressing these issues? Well, one of, the, one of the issues is how one frames and conceptualizes the problem mm -hmm. of what went wrong. We actually, TOSCA, our Chemical Regulation Act, was very smart in a sense because we were driven by ideas of economic efficiency and we said that People should not be required to test their chemicals if, after all, they didn't pose enormous risks. So we told the regulatory agencies, show that we need more information as a basis for doing a good risk assessment, and then you can get the companies to, to produce more information. Well, that sounds smart, but it turned out that everybody started fighting on the very threshold issue of whether or not there was enough information so that you needed to generate more. So the Europeans, I think partly because they're trying to produce an understandable common metric for quite diverse countries with very different regulatory cultures, they've taken an approach that looks less efficient on the surface, but may in the implementation actually turn out to be much easier. And that is to require the same minimum packet of information from all chemicals that are being produced. And so one of the the other sort of positive dimensions that goes with breasts being understandable and moms being universal is that, of course, today we have a global environmental community and movement and, and information doesn't stay put. And so, you know, people here know that there are other approaches being tried out elsewhere. So I think that, that um, the combination of a, you know, a really much faster flowing information world out there and engaged people like these two people on my two sides, that that's where I would look to for you know, new energies to come from. And there are other models out there. It's, it's very difficult just to step back and say this country's doing it well and that country's yeah. doing it badly because I think there are some things we do superbly well even now. I mean, you know, it would be a, a big error to say that we've lost our leadership position across the board. We haven't. But I think that recognizing that there are different ways of going about you know, generating information, creating incentives, that, that's very important. Could I add, I, I think that at Silent Spring Institute, one of the things that we're trying to do when we decide what kind of research to do is to try to figure out what information would be helpful to push this forward. Um, so we created the, the first comprehensive list of the chemicals that cause breast tumors in animals so that now people can refer to that. And we're trying to uh, study very long lists of hormone disruptors in homes. So we actually were the ones who discovered that the U.S. had uh, 10 times the brominated flame retardants in houses as, as the Europeans. And, and then, actually, uh, we're unusual in that we report to our, our own study participants, and some of them have themselves become active and taken their own results mm -hmm. to public forums and spoken about them. Um, and just this past spring, we actually tested uh, 50 types of household products because we don't really require people to even tell us. We don't require companies to even tell us what's in all the products on the shelf. Um, and when we, we, we approached this first by asking them, and then when companies wouldn't tell us, we sent um, products to the lab and tested for a large number of these hormone disruptors and also some asthma-related chemicals so that um, we can begin to uh, drive a new public understanding of what's going on. The next stage, I think, is that we need to also develop 
very uh, cheaper, faster methods so that we can screen the large numbers of chemicals that, that haven't been tested and figure out which ones are the priorities. And Julia, it's worth pointing out that side by side with this, there's also the huge explosion in susceptibility testing because of the genetic revolution so that it's not just the, the effect of the chemicals that we're gradually homing in on, but also information about the body's susceptibilities. Yes. And, and that information is accumulating at a rate faster than we know how to process. But, but I think that the, uh, that's a place where one can imagine scientific benefits coming from. In the, yeah, I think future. we think of all cancers as being a combination of genes and environment. And, and one uh, scientist said right now we have a kind of um, fiddler crab with the giant genome claw. We've decoded mm -hmm. the human genome, and we have this tiny exposome claw and need to focus there to get some balance on that equation. It's a wonderful metaphor. Well, I think now's the time of the conversation to bring you all into the conversation. You've been great listeners. Now we want you to ask some great questions uh, to continue to direct our conversation. So at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, we have some simple rules for our question, uh, for folks who ask questions. Uh, we've got four microphones. Uh, there's two here on the floor. There's two on the, um, in the boxes on the stairwell. Uh, so please don't rush up at once. <laughs> Uh, but basically, if anybody wants to ask a question, stand up, identify themselves and their affiliation. Uh, questions end in a question mark, and they do not contain a speech within the question. Uh, so three simple rules, and uh, this is usually the best part of our forums. So uh, Sita, you want to go right. first? Uh, hello, my name's Sita Gofard. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and I'm wondering, you mentioned that um, there are a lot of, of, of dangerous uh, carcinogens um, right here in our own home, in our soil, in our water, in our food. Um, and I was just wondering how people can best protect themselves and best make themselves aware of those dangers in order to try to prevent that from, from, um, from being in contact with those. Great. So number there, one, no. I think coming up soon, vote. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we have an opportunity to reform the Toxic Substances Control Act, we, we hope someday. Uh, the Safe Chemicals Act is uh, a new model for how we would deal with chemicals uh, and uh, require information about their safety before they go to market. Um, there, are also, there is also consumer power. We've seen that when people decided they didn't want um, they didn't want certain chemicals in their products, manufacturers have been responsive. And so there, there is some power there uh, outside the electrical process. There's also more information out there than you might think. So uh, one of the pieces of legislation that we enacted a while back um, after the chemical disaster in Bhopal in India in 1984 was uh, to require all companies, all industries to report the chemicals that they were releasing into the environment. And that has been taken over again by a lot of environmental groups and translated. That, that information has been translated so that you can go in for your zip code and find out even for your house what kind of chemical loadings there are in the environment. So that's just one example of a very powerful information instrument. But you know, I think that to become informed consumers, you have to become a little aware of what's out there as well. I think there are some opportunities for self-knowledge also. You know, we live in this, this era now. I, I'm a journalist, and we talk about citizen journalism, where citizens go out and sort of report from their own communities. And you're, you're kind of seeing almost the same thing with science now, with it, people deciding to, to test their products, which now has become more affordable. The technology's better. Um, and, and, and then they post it on the internet. So, that, so there's sort of a lot of knowledge about, you know, at least much more than there was 10 or 15 years ago, years ago about what's actually in your toothpaste. And, um, and what it does to lab animals, for example. Um, unfortunately, it requires you know, some time and effort. And as a mother, I can tell you, um, we, you know, we don't always have that time to make sure we're buying you know, exactly the right kind of toothpaste. Um, so, I, so I would also say I think it's really important to sort of put, keep political pressure on to adapt the system so that it's not just your responsibility to be a firewall for the exposures in your home. But really, it, it should be someone else's problem, and, and it should be the government's. Thank you. I, I have to put in a plug for silentspring.org. There's a take action tab that will give you some practical advice. It's okay to put a plug in for yourself. That's good. All right. Yes, next question. Thank you. 
very much. Good evening. My name is Tanya Ragush, and I'm from uh, Croatia, and I'm actually a student here at uh, the Kennedy School. Thank you very much, ladies, for uh, sharing your time and insight tonight on a very crucial um, issue. Um, Professor Yasinov, you, you suggested that um, perhaps the way forward is uh, uh, public, um, public intervention and maybe in the form of, uh, of public-private uh, enterprise uh, or initiatives. Um, the, you spoke about a lot of things that are taking place through legislation um, in India and I understand here as well. Um, what kind of international cooperation uh, is, is going on uh, to make uh, uh, this aware to all the women in the world? And uh, what can we do uh, in the short to midterm future? Thank you. Well, that's a huge question, especially at a moment when the idea of international cooperation is in very bad odor in some quarters. And there, I would second Julia and say, vote, because I think that one, uh, there are very important issues at stake here. But I want to say something different about the public-private um, associations or partnerships, as they're sometimes called. That's not exactly what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of something that I would sooner call a renewal of the social contract, which is another kind of language we've been hearing. So I'm not talking about governments lining up with corporations to figure out in a satisfying way you know, what would work best for the economic interests of companies. And to some extent, that already happens in regulatory bargaining anyway. I'm talking about a sort of renewal of the idea that public health is indeed a public good and that the only entity that can be responsible for that is government. And I think that the kind of point Florence was making about the rise of citizen science all over the world is one pathway by which this can be generated because it's a demonstration by citizens that what we used to take as a common sense understanding, knowledge about the universe so that we can be kept safe was something that government was supposed to produce. Well, government isn't producing that in the same way. And I think by generating information, using all these new resources of communication, testing, and so on, citizens can put that issue back on the table and say, you know, who ought to be doing this? It's a collective enterprise. And that's why one needs to vote for particular modes of collective behavior over others. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Morello, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the JFK Junior uh, Forum Student Committee here at the IOP. Um, so you guys have, have kind of described some of the household products, such as toothpaste and couches, that can contribute to cancers. I'm wondering if you could discuss um, the effect of food on cancers. So I know that like there are studies that have linked um, the antibiotics used in the um, livestock industry and, and our meat and dairy products. Um, two forms of cancer. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I'm not an expert on diet and cancer. Um, we have been interested, though, in food packaging and compounds in food packaging that end up in the food and then end up in us. Um, we did a study of some of the hormone disruptors that are in uh, food can linings and plastic wrap and processed food and actually found that uh, you could reduce your urine levels of uh, some of these hormone disruptors by more than half in just three days by switching to a fresh food diet. So we can see that that's a really important exposure source for some of these Once chemicals. Once you look at food in your... Well, I actually participated in that Silent Spring study, so, yeah. and, and my seven-year-old daughter did also. So we, um, we underwent this experiment where we sort of lived our normal lives, ate normal diets, and I tried to do sort of a normal American diet, which included some canned food, not a ton, but a little bit, um, and, and then measured our urinary levels. Uh, and then, then I, I kind of I went, a little bit, uh, I went a little bit farther than some other members of the study. I became a vegan for a few days, and I didn't even get in my car because our cars outgas phthalates and other chemicals. Um, and, and my levels dropped really dramatically but I had to live this almost, you know, sort of um, Amish, you know, life. Um, so it's really not easy. And, and to me, that, that brought home the message that, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to take meaningful responsibility. 
with the food, I'm amazed, again, as I was with household products, that there's so much we don't know. We don't know, you know, most uh, beef cattle are, are fed uh, growth stimulants. We really don't know how much of those end up in our hamburger, and we don't know how much of them end up in our bodies or, or what they do to our cells once they're in there. So, uh, you know, I think there's a tremendous need for, for more science and, and, and for that science really to be um, sort of required, you know, by, by the government who can do it. Question. Yes. Uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm uh, an alumnus of Harvard. Um, my question is that uh, it seems like this problem has to be confronted both from a regulatory perspective and a free market perspective. And I think of places like Whole Foods, which has uh, cultivated a constituency of people that are willing to pay a little more for higher quality products. And we're talking about food, and perhaps organic food may be more healthy and have less of these hormone disruptors. What I'm wondering is, um, in the case of or organic labeling of products, um, is, is that sufficiently accurate? Um, and are, are there other things that could be done to encourage um, a more natural engagement with products that have less complex chemicals? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, labeling is a, is a pretty interesting, you know, global political issue at the moment. Um, our organics labeling came out of a, an enormous political struggle in which a large agribusiness was on one side wanting certain kinds of things about the production process not to be labeled, and citizens by and large were massively on the other side wanting those things to be labeled. Uh, so a rather complex thing came out of that. And as with all of these you know, really contested uh, questions, it's not clear that the outcome that emerges is somehow optimal. And one hasn't necessarily asked all the right questions then and there. So it's, you know, it would be a mistake to think that just because something bears the organic label, necessarily it's safer, more nutritious, and less environmentally burdensome. So I think new questions have opened up about things like, you know, where did the environmental effects happen that that were that are now affecting us, what is the distance that the food traveled, even if it is organic. So I think all of that deserves to be opened up. The piece that is very, very difficult is that the way that our American regulatory structure is now configured, um, there are certain questions that you can't open up. I mean, so you know, everybody knows that the ban on labeling milk treated with bovine growth hormone was had nothing to do with consumer wishes. Consumers did want that label to happen. But our regulatory structure doesn't actually allow you to have that label because people think there's something wrong with treating animals a certain way or something wrong in an industrialized production process that doesn't allow for local exceptions and, and other ways of being. So, you know, we would need to open that up. And again, I think that some of the answers are going to come either by state level action. There's a GM labeling referendum on the California ballot, which will be interesting to watch this November. So, you know, the federal system has its own sort of safeguards. And, you know, again, sort of activism to say we want this kind of information in addition to that. All right, thanks. Back in the front. Hi, Rebecca Williams. Uh, I'm a nursing instructor at Bunker Hill Community College. And I have a question, how are you referring to California having new laws? And California has a lot of laws for environmental health. And why are we not seeing that in other states or even at the federal level? Do you want the funding path? Oh, we could share it, I guess. Okay, um, <laughs> there, there have been some interesting state initiatives that uh, have banned certain chemicals. The, phase out of the brominated flame retardants started with some state bans, and there have been state rules about BPA in different products. We have uh, rules here in Massachusetts about BPA. So I think uh, we're getting a, a mixture of, of state regulations of all different kinds in uh, California, but also in, in other states as well. So I think that, um, well, California is sui generis in a, in a lot of ways. But um, across the nation, I think there are states that have been leaders and to some degree laggards in a lot of different environmental matters. So I would second Julia that 
not all innovation is coming from California, and one should look to other places as well. And there's nothing wrong with the idea that somebody should go ahead and set a standard that others then try to, to live up to. It's a huge market. If California regulates in a certain way, industry has to watch to some extent to, to try to you know, follow those standards. It's, it's not just a matter of um, you know, one state being an exception. That exception can be quite powerful and can set a model for others. Thanks. Back over here. Hi. <clears throat> Um, my name is Mia Davis. I'm the former organizing director of the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics and the National Work Group for Safe Markets. So I've been working to get toxic chemicals out of consumer products for my whole career and now just started a company where I'm going to be trying to make sure that endocrine disruptors and carcinogens don't make it into personal care products that we're slathering all over our bodies every day. Um, and I'm so glad that we talked a bit about um, activism and um, how we can be voting with our dollars and voting to pass protective, health protective legislation. My question uh, was going to be on that, but now that I'm up here, um, I wonder if you could speak for a minute to the manufacture of doubt. So when Rachel Carson was testifying before Congress, she was basically told that she was a silly woman, that she was emotional and overreacting, and that she was trying, it was conjecture, and that she, she wasn't and a sexist. good scientist. Incredibly, incredibly yeah. sexist, but also um, there was a manufacture of doubt that happened 50 years ago. Uh, that happened in, uh, when we were talking about big tobacco in the 70s and 80s. Um, if, the, if they get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And if they can test BPA on rats that are resilient to endocrine disruption, they can, you know, certain studies can be funded to prove or find whatever needs to be found to keep chemicals on the market. And um, it, I, I'm almost hearing myself sound a, a little bit conspiratorial when I say this, except that it's right there, and the um, American Chemistry Council has hired the same lobbyists, the exact same lobbyists that Big Tobacco hired. So I wondered if you could speak a bit to that legacy and what Rachel Carson faced then and how we're still dealing with that, and if you have any perspective on that. Uh, as a scientist, that is a very difficult situation because the resources, uh, industry has enormous resources to discredit scientists by um, generating doubt, just as you said. We're seeing that now for the flame retardants. Um, and uh, I, I think we have a, a similar situation. And, uh, one, of the, one of the fundamental ways in which industry is uh, generating doubt is particularly relevant to breast cancer because um, the, we, we are not going to have the ability to use human epidemiology to find the links between chemicals and cancer. So we do need to make inferences from animal and cell studies. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, industry has been manufacturing doubt is, is just to s dismiss uh, the biological evidence entirely. Uh, that was one of the things that was very powerful about the Institute of Medicine report and before that the President's Cancer Panel report in 2009, which uh, really said we do need to pay attention to the laboratory studies and laboratory evidence and uh, use that to make decisions about exposures. Um, but, but I do think that's a very contentious and difficult issue. So I, I have some quite strong feelings about that question. I think it's a very important one. But I'm a little bit uncomfortable at the end of the day with the phrase manufacturing doubt. And that's partly because science doesn't advance by saying that certainties are created that can't be questioned. Uh, it advances by looking and seeing that there are new questions. So there's a sort of missing word there somehow, manufacturing inappropriate doubt or unwanted doubt or doubt when it shouldn't be morally needed or whatever. I mean, you know, so. <laughs> So if you recognize that, then you recognize that something that actually my field has been demonstrating for a long time, that people don't ultimately agree on things because the factual claim is so strong. They agree on things because they've agreed that a set of values will be best served by agreeing that a factual statement about things ought to be a certain way. So there's a separate stage of having to agree on certain value presumptions, and those include trust in one's regulatory bodies. 
So I think the work that something, a body like the Union of Concerned Scientists is doing to make sure that federal regulatory scientists are not exposed to attack and that their integrity is not being inappropriately questioned or political rewriting of their science is not taking place. Those initiatives are great because they help to rebuild a kind of public trust in people who will have to decide under conditions of uncertainty. There's always going to be a level of doubt, so we have to create the trust that allows us to bridge that. Well, good news is we've got time for both your questions, so but these will be, so nobody, if, you, if anybody else has a question, sorry, but we'll stick with these two and, and uh, no, no, you're good. You're, you're at the mic, it's good. Just, I'm letting the woman behind you know she's good too. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Qian Qi Huang. I'm with the Asian Breast Cancer Project. And um, their research indicate that Asian women living in the United States 10 years or longer have an 80% higher risk of developing breast cancer than uh, recent immigrants or, uh, or uh, the, their counterparts from the uh, home country. So unfortunately, I fit that criteria and I was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 40. So my, I mean, to me, it's very clear that, it, you know, this seems to attribute to the environment. And my question to you is that, uh, do you think that this applies to all ethnic groups? And do you have any plan to do comparative research study comparing, um, you know, women, immigrants to the United States versus uh, the counterpart in the other parts of the world? I'm sorry to hear about your own experience. Um, the, the evidence that you talk about is one of the key pieces that tells us that there are preventable causes of breast cancer uh, because, as you said, it has been seen that uh, breast cancer incidence in Asia has been historically lower than in the U.S., but when women move from Asia to, say, California, where incidence is very high, their risk goes up and their daughters and granddaughters' risk goes up uh, and as they assimilate. Um, we're also seeing uh, breast cancer incidence in China and in the developing countries that, uh, rising faster, very fast. Um, so this is part of what tells us that there are things about modern society that are contributing to risk. I had the great pleasure to be part of a uh, an effort by the California Breast Cancer Research Program to try to understand what's going on in California. And they um, did begin some new, very innovative research to try to figure out what are the things about uh, coming to California that are different and how do the different generations uh, change in ways that are related to breast cancer risk. And I'm very excited to see that work go forward. This will be our last question, although don't leave when we're done with this because there is an award presentation when we're finished. Hi, my name is Larissa Sapko, and I'm with the nonprofit Community Works. Um, I'm worried this question is going to sound slightly uninformed because I'm slightly uninformed about this topic, but you mentioned that many chemicals that mess with your hormone levels, specifically estrogen, can increase the risk of breast cancer, and when I heard that, the first thing I thought of was hormonal birth control. So my question is, is taking the pill going to give me breast cancer? And also, why don't I, I already know the answer to that question? So why isn't there, for me, I haven't seen much of a dialogue between like reproductive rights and cancer risk, especially because there's a lot of technology surrounding birth control now. Lots of people have that question. So it's really great to get a chance to answer it. Um, uh, so we do know that estrogen, progesterone, hormone replacement therapy increases breast cancer risk. That is happening later in life when risk is higher. Um, oral contraceptives also have similar characteristics, although the dose and the time in life is very different. So we do expect that oral contraceptives contribute to breast cancer risk, but uh, women are using oral contraceptives at a time in life when their overall risk is very low. Uh, and uh, it's been seen in epidemiology that the risk diminishes back 
after uh, women have been off oral contraceptives for five years. So, so people can make a decision based on what's going on in their life at that time um, about how they want to uh, use contraceptives. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I now want to call up to the stage uh, two women, Cheryl Osimo, who was one of the founding board members of the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, and Dr. Kathy Rogovin, who's a founding and current board member of Silent Spring Institute, for a presentation. Thank you. We're honored to stand here today to introduce an extraordinary woman and recognize her long-standing dedication to a crucial and often overlooked cause. Teresa Hines has worked tirelessly to propel our understanding of the detrimental impact that chemicals in our environment have on our health, especially women's health. An effective advocate, she has served as a leader and critical force for change. On September 20th, 1996, exactly 16 years ago today, the Teresa and H. John Hines III Foundation launched the Women, Health, and Environment Conference series in Boston. In her opening remarks, Mrs. Hines told the audience that the conference series followed from three years of investigation by the Heinz Foundation into the issue of women's health. The research looked at the state of women's health and the environment, alternative medicine, menopause, and how we prepare for a longer, healthy life. Her vision introduced a new way for the audience to think about their health, the health of their families, and the special health risks from an unhealthy environment. Mrs. Hines said, the goal of this national conference series is to encourage the development of practices that prevent illness linked to the physical and cultural environment. Since the series was launched, 15 conferences have been held, reaching a total of nearly 25,000 health science and environmental professionals, as well as government officials. Mrs. Hines and her family foundation have also offered generous support to help researchers, including scientists at Silent Spring Institute, break new ground in our understanding of the environment and women's health, and to aid advocacy to empower change. Her work and generosity have made a direct and substantial impact advancing this important cause. Before we give Mrs. Heinz this much deserved award and hear remarks from her, I'd like to leave you with a couple of quotes from, that, from her speech at the 2002 Conference for Women, Health, and the Environment. It is sad but true, she said, that our collective view of health still does not make sufficient allowance for the importance of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the chemical soup in which we are unwittingly immersing ourselves from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, and the roles these play in many, many serious conditions. She concluded by advocating for policies that focus on the prevention of disease, and she said, if women will organize, government will react, and if women speak, history will listen. So we thank you, Teresa Hines. We thank you so very much. We thank you for your vital work in addressing the links between our worrisome environment and our health, particularly breast cancer. And as we honor the 50th anniversary of the publication of Rachel Carson's seminal work, Silent Spring, it is the perfect time to honor you for your dedication to advancing this important cause. So on behalf of the Mass Breast Cancer Coalition and Silent Spring Institute, we are honored. It is our privilege to present you with the Rachel Carson Advocacy Award.
Well, <coughs> for someone who's coming from Pittsburgh down the, down the road, really, uh, from Rachel Carson's home, um, on the Allegheny River, this is a particular honor for me. Um, I've known some of these ladies for a while. We've done some battles together. I have some other friends, Regina, all kinds of people. My daughter-in-law was here at Harvard doing something for a couple of days. Um, and I also got cancer, breast cancer, three years ago. So there you are, talking about all this thing I'm supposed to know, I'm supposed to prevent, and I got whacked. And there were so many questions I wanted to also answer when you were asking questions. I thought they were very good questions. And I would say anybody, there were several young, young men who talked about, um, asked about food and causalities of different kinds. And I have to say yes, 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 yes. I also have to say for one of you asked about where do I learn about this. For example, right here at Harvard at School of Public Health, Dr. Jack Spengler is the world foremost person on indoor pollution. And he says there's worse pollution in your apartment, not necessarily yours, but a lot of people's houses, than there is in schools than there is breathing dirty air. And he explains exactly what and what you do about it. So you have wonderful people right here who can do from public health to um, go and take a course on green chemistry. You know what we didn't know 15 years ago, and we do now, is the role of green chemistry, or some people call chemistry for the environment. And how a green chemist teaches chemistry is very different from how a normal chemistry teacher teaches chemistry. You look at chemistry in a way that looks at the end product from the, looking at the parts and seeing which are the noxious parts which you don't want to use, as opposed to let's do this product and then analyze it and it's too late. So there are a lot of things that you can get the parts of. And, and it's very exciting. Um, but these, these conferences were important because I'm a daughter, a daughter of an oncologist. Uh, I grew up with medicine. I grew up watching my dad. And I grew up in Africa, watching medicine being practiced also in the bush and weekends, etc. And what I learned as a little girl, age five, six, seven, eight, was a relationship between the world around us, meaning the bush, or the sea, or bad waters, or whatever, and survival. And so I became what didn't exist then, an environmentalist, simply because, and, it, and the word didn't, I never heard that word, but that's why I became. I made the correlations between what we do, what we eat, what we expose ourselves to, and surviving, because in the bush, if you don't, you die. Simple. I find the question someone asked about Europe, because I also lived in Europe, one of the things that is easier for Europeans and for Americans to do, by and large, other than Californians, is that they are more likely to accept homeopathics, simple, um, old-fashioned medications, and to remedy things in a more um, a unilateral decision, say, by the government or anything. They say, you can't do this, and they don't do it. And that's their inclination. Americans are much more, generally, much more um, individualistic and much more, um, again, it's a, it's a rule that's to be broken. But I find them more individualistic and more stubborn about their rights. But in Europe, it's easy to do. It's easy to institute these things. And so, um, in Africa too. I mean, if they tell you you're going to have to have this kind of a vaccine or that or the other, you do. You don't ask. So, I would say that um, estrogens, I got an estrogen cancer, okay? And you, several questions were asked about estrogens, foods, etc. No woman today 
who's had cancer should be allowed to touch milk that is not, not organic. It has to be pasture and medication free. I mean, no, no growth hormones, nothing. Likewise, meat. No meat that has growth hormones. No meat that has any junk in it. No dairy that has junk in it. But no, no doctors tell you that. I just do it because I study food a lot. But if you go to a doctor that's an integrative doctor, they'll tell you, be careful. So there's a lot we have to know. There's a lot we know by inference. And there's a lot we must learn and ask and be insistent. But you can't be giving, you couldn't be giving children growth hormones in their milk, etc. Shouldn't. Um, so there's an awful lot. There's an awful lot. And um, I think we're getting there. But it's exciting to know that what we already know, if we can get our hands around it, can really help us um, stay well and um, not get hit like so many people do. As far as China, which was mentioned, by the way, China has had a rise of about 20% breast cancer in the last few years, at least around the big cities. And one of my friends, a doctor, teaches there uh, every year or two, and she's a surgeon. And she was very stunned by that because she goes. And I said, you know, look around. Beijing, for instance, or Shanghai. I hadn't been to Beijing or Shanghai for 23 years, and I went two years ago. And I was stunned. Beautiful. At least a lot of it. But it's modern in a way that has all of our modern sins and facilities and makeup and plastics. And all of those things we know have estrogenicity in it, which creates cancer. So what I told her to do in terms of research is to go and check some of the outer villages away from Beijing, away from the big metropolis, and see if those women have the same relationship and the same kind of cancer rates. The other thing that's interesting, again, a parallel. One of my scientist friends who does a lot of global uh, climate change and works with the Chinese, etc., was up there before the Kyoto talks. And one of his counterparts in Beijing said, you know, our children are getting stupid now. And he said, really? They're not getting stupid. Yes, they're getting stupider and stupider. So I asked my friend, I said, is this a, you know, attention deficit? Because they're building coal plants, coal fire plants all the time. They're burning coal like mad. <clears throat> and this, we know, has tremendous impacts on children, on their so there's all kinds of things that are happening with the development. And so it's so interesting to look at that and to see how you do it so that people don't get all these sicknesses. So environment is what is around us. And so this is a very um, warm feeling for me because it's a passion that I have for a lot of reasons. It's about prevention. It's about being hopeful even as you are concerned and scared sometimes. But it's something that we can do for ourselves and certainly for my grandchildren and my kids and yours. Um, and I, I am honored because this is, you can see this is something I really care about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you couldn't, couldn't have had a nicer award and honor than having this. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Mrs. Hine. Thanks for those, those heartfelt remarks. And how about another round of, how about a round of applause for our distinguished panel? Thank you. Very much. Um,
tomorrow afternoon in the forum, we have the president of Mongolia, who's a Harvard Kennedy School alum. It was actually lottery, but if you want to go find one of the staff members, we might be nice to you and let you have a ticket. Um, but so we'll see you around the semester at the forum. Thanks, and have a good evening. <laughs> Thanks.